Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a really an honor to be part of the seminar, which sounds so so exciting, fascinating, and, you know, things that we all love. And especially, I wanted to thank Chiara who invited me and Professor Van der Bosse, who was leading the, the seminar uh, again. Uh, the trouble to come here this morning has not been easy, but uh, <laughs> with, with trains, with, uh, with flights, and so on and so forth, but I'm very, very excited to be able to share my latest research with you today. So, Democracy and Defeat, Morante, Morabia, and Malaparte in Capri, 1946. Um, I know that the, the, the audience, uh, um, you know, everything is translated into English, uh, despite I'm working specifically on, on this, on this uh, paper uh, with Italian literature. But if you have questions, feel free to stop me and I can maybe provide some insight on specific authors or situation. Um, yeah, so how we did this shared memory of fascism and its cultural heritage to shame remains the most disputed question in the nation's modern history, crossing the boundaries uh, between academic and public discourses. The legacy of fascism and World War II represent for Italians a contested battlefield of memory. The locus where national identities negotiated, a history, as anthropologist Michel Roth Trujillo would say, in which key constituent parts are missing. My talk today will concentrate uh, to the years in which the struggle to establish a shared memory was at, uh, at its peak. Those between the downfall of Mussolini in uh, the July 1943 and the victory of the Christian Democrats uh, over the left in the 1948 the general election. So I'm going to give a political framework for this literary, literary analysis. Subject to political, ideological, and juridical uh, controversy, the post-fascist transition in Italy was the period in which competing narratives over the recent national past took shape. These narratives commanded the public discourse and justified political agendas for decades to come. Uh, in recent years, the transition <clears throat> to democracy has been the subject of increasing international debate, uh, in which uh, leading scholars interpreted through a, the lens of a widespread repression of the fascist past. This paradigm, however, only partially reflects transition diverse intellectual and human scenario. I will challenge this, challenge this interpretation by focusing on the ideological and cultural fluidity of early post war Italy, in which pre war war views were now completely discredited and new oppositions were not clearly defined. The Italian case is, in fact, a unique case study for broader questions such as regime change and transition after dictatorship. In this scenario, early post-war literary practices became a primary means of communicating intellectual discontent. In my talk, I will question a long-standing ideological tradition of confining the cultural production of early post-war Italy solely to the neo-realist discourse, thus underplaying Neorealism's disruptive political value, and how it was a really a new wave with fresh air in a <clears throat> in a, the broader sense uh, for it, uh, Italy's culture. This is also the reason why my talk today does not begin in one of the country's cultural capitals, but in the charming island of Capri. And more specifically, in one of the most celebrated modernist residences in Italy, the Casa Malaparte which Jean-Luc Godard made famous with his film Le Mépris. And this is an iconic scene, no need for explanation, but it was shot exactly in Casa Malaparte. In 1946, the three protagonists of my talk, authors Elsa Morande, Alberto Morabio, and Cuccio Malaparte, convened in Capri for a dinner. <laughs> oh, here it is, okay. So this is Moravia, Elsa Morande, and Malaparte. Uh, who who they are, it, that is very, very important, because uh, Malaparte, uh, Malaparte was uh, probably the most important intellectual of uh, the fascist regime. He tried to be the ideologue of the fascist regime, we discussed about it later, but he also was uh, confined and put to jail by Mussolini. So, a very particular figure that had a European allure and success. Um, Moravia and Morante will be probably, if not the most uh, influential, but among the most influential writers of the second part of the 20th century. What is interesting is that they were both, both of Jewish origin, they both survived the war, they were married at that time, and they represent a completely different kind of idea of Italian literature and, you know, from a fascist writer. And yet, their destinies intertwined in very specific ways. 
especially because during in the late thirties and the forties, Malaparte had this important and understudied journal called Prospettive, in which people like Joyce was writing, just to tell you how important it was. And both of the two, with pseudonyms, were able to write, despite uh, both uh, Morante and Moravia could not uh, officially write for their Jewish origin in, the, in a fascist state. So, who they are? Why Capri? Capri is a stunning place. And yet it was not uh, the lush place for um, very rich people that it is today. Uh, at that time, it was a, a place where intellectual and fishermen were, were not, not all together, but uh, were a crowd in the island. Uh, it was relatively cheaper, and it was one of the many places that was in a sort of periphery, an international hub for intellectuals. So that's the place where discussions were taking place in a very peculiar way. Why 1946? Because after the, the um, excitement of the end of the war, the end of fascism, of 44, 45, uh, 46 is the moment when this great excitement is trying to show some, some creak, some, some problem, and some intellectuals are already seeing the uh, reactionary move of, of politics that will take place later on. So that's why I'm concentrating on my talk, starting from a dinner, from a moment of discussion outside the main capitals of, of the country. So, they were all renowned writers, but of radically different political persuasion. Their opinion diverged, but their books were also at odds with the cultural trends of the period. Their private writings of, the, of those uh, uh, hectic months <coughs> revealed their contrasted opinions, beginning with how S. Morante recorded Mussolini's death in a diary on May 1st, 1945. Morante describes the dictator as the champion of a people with no sense of common good. This is the first of my <coughs> uh, quotation from Morante's uh, diary. All these crimes of Mussolini's were tolerated, even encouraged and applauded. Now, a people that tolerates its leader's crimes becomes an accomplice to these crimes. It encourages and applauds them. It becomes worse than an accomplice, an instigator of these crimes. Did the majority of the Italian population realize these acts were crimes? Almost always they realize it. But such is the Italian people that it gives its votes to the strong rather than to the just. And it's made to choose between personal gain and duty. Even as it knows what its duty would be, it chooses personal gain. So, a strong accusation uh, of, of the Italian people and their you know, commitment to fascism. Morante's focus on the ethical accountability of the Italian people for crimes perpetrated by Mussolini challenges the political narratives of the following years. These narratives, fostered by the new party system that governed the country after the liberation, aimed at legitimizing the birth of the new republic after the ordeal of the war, claiming that Italians, especially common people, preserved a moral stability despite 20 years of dictatorship. On the contrary, Morante ascribes the considerable support Mussolini and his regime enjoyed to the individual and collective choices that sustained the dictator and the fascist and fascism until World War II. A little more than a year later, Morante and her husband Moravia were the guests of Malaparte for dinner at his house in Capri. This is another view of this amazing residence. At the time, Malaparte was at the peak of its literary fame. His novel Caput, published in 1944 in Naples, while the war was still raging, quickly became a bestseller across Europe. And in a letter that I found in the archives to his old friend Giuseppe Prezzolini, an, an intellectual uh, um, that was very prominent in Italy and at that time was the director of an Italian house at Columbia University in New York, the author vividly describes the dinner with Morante and Moravia, the same dinner that <laughs> we were discussing. Mor uh, Malaparte wrote indignant, indignantly of the views his guests expressed on that occasion. At a certain point, writes uh, Malaparte, I don't know why, it occurred to Moravia to ask me, sneakily, if I was sorry Italy had lost the war. Naturally, I immediately responded that not only am I sorry Italy lost the war, but I'm profoundly saddened it didn't win it. Protest from Moravia and his wife, who cried, No, it's a good thing that Italy lost the war, deserve a force, etc., etc. Malaparte concludes the letter with personal remarks on the state of the country after the military defeat. 
I believe, dear Prezzolini, that the only way to react to wretchedness, to defeat, to dishonor, to humiliation, is to feel that one is Italian to proclaim oneself Italian, etc. Malaparte's response to Italy's fall was, as he himself states in English in the letter, my country, right or wrong. The private writings of Morante and Malaparte bear witness to the political and cultural discontent of these years and how, on how to navigate the post-fascist transition in national history. They sample a larger disagreement with, the, with the, what I call the narratives of redemption of, you know, of national rebirth, they were called secondo risorgimento in Italy, that took shape between uh, the demise of Mussolini and uh, the, um, the, the general election of 1948. Whether fostered by the resistance myth of a new risorgimento for the country or sanctioned by Benedetto Croce's authoritative reading of the fascist Ventennio as a parenthesis in Italian history, the idea of a collective redemption prompted interpretation of the recent past, not as one of catastrophe, but one of a moral regeneration. And the words of this uh, moral regeneration were redenzione, on and on the political discourse of the time, or riscatto, which literally means uh, ransom. Words that were ubiquitous in the, in the current political debate. Uh, from uh, Ferruccio Pari's prime minister speeches uh, to the poems and literature of the time. Uh, this language appropriated and then normalized the slogans of the armed insurrection against fascism and the Nazi invaders. So political redemption and moral regeneration informed collective memory of the time for decades to come, legitimizing the new party system that granted continuity to the Italian state. So the regenerative impact of neorealism reinforce a collective sense of a new beginning. There was clearly neorealism was the most influential uh, cultural movement of, of that time in Italy, you know, you know, just in Italy. Well, documenting a collective war drama, uh, war trauma, sorry, or the structural injustice of Italian society, so cinematic uh, gems such as Roberto Rossellini's Roman Open City, maybe one of the final scenes, or Lucchio Visconti, The Earth Trembles, paved a clear path to collective rebirth, turning the singular private struggle, uh, individual struggle, into a meaningful fragment of a new national epic. And I love this final scene because uh, for people who haven't seen the film, after the killing of all the, the resistance, uh, the bunch of kids who are witnessing that, they go together as a community. And you can see that there, there is a, something looming large, the Vatican. So a clear idea that there is a hope and the possibilities to Christian redemption. And by the way, the domes are always there in every uh, scene with ruins, uh, domes of different churches in Rossellini's films of that time. So, uh, the literary counterparts to these mo mo momentous films expressed, as Charles Levitt Levy, recently put it, the profound faith in the power of culture to redeem society, a faith that was fre frequently communicated in Christian terms, even in speeches by the Communist Party. Subsequent <coughs> cultural accounts of the transition prefer to ignore inconvenient experiences like those typified by Morante and Malaparte, as they complicate the frame of national narratives of redemption. Only in 1999, uh, Jewish journalist Enzo Forcella, who after the 1943 armistice did not join the resistance, wrote how he was unable to assimilate his own experience to what he calls as the dialectical template of error, bewilderment, and redemption. The error of more or less convinced support for fascism, the bewilderment provoked by the disaster of September 8th, uh, when the state collapsed, literally, and the realization of one's political commitment with the consequent redemption to the participation in the resistance. This is not going an attempt to go against the resistance as a, the meaningful movement, the popular movement that really helped the liberation of Italy. But also, but it, it's instead of going against the appropriation of the resistance as a myth for the founding republic from the parties that legitimize their, their consensus without taking responsibility as Italians to what happened in the Second World War. From opposite ideological perspectives, Morante, Moravia, and Malaparte challenge the assumption of Italy's moral regeneration after the break with fascism. And I love this picture that was taken in the days right after fascism in a private house in, uh, in Catania, in the south of Italy, showing how the, 
the, the gods of Mussolini and the fascism, in a way, were still present in, in the same houses, despite the facement. So, in the early post-war period, coming to terms with the discontinuity implied denouncing Italian responsibility in World War II, and often discussing the national defeat, as typified by the private writers we just mentioned. Uh, these recognitions, however, engendered the definitive shipwreck, not the rebirth of the national state, born with the Risorgimento. And the idea was just that only an analysis, an uncompromising analysis, analysis of the shipwreck would be the first step towards the emancipation from fascism. So, in my presentation, I will discuss three specific books of that time that were represented the intellectual frenzy of the period, uh, the Italian transition. First, it's going to be Malaparte's Volga Rises in Europe, uh, a book written by a fascist author and confiscated by fascist authorities in 1943. Then we're going to see why. Second, a book that has never been published but has been planned, that's called uh, Moravia's uh, Political Diary, uh, that was, you know, pub um, prepared in the period during the, the transition, but the, the content is very interesting because Moravia became a very a point of reference for the Italian left, uh, but that was never published for political reasons. And finally, Morandes Lights and Sorcery, Menzogna and Sortilegio, published in 1948, that concludes the transition uh, with a strong crit critique of democracy in Italy. I go with the, the first, uh, my, my first analysis. Admitting the defeat. Cuzzo Malaparte, uh, the Volga rises in Europe. <clears throat> so, one character in Malaparte's novel Caput claims in 1943 that it was still impossible to tell what country would win the war, but it was clear what countries had already lost it, Poland and Italy. As also alluded to by Malaparte in his letters to Prezzolini, the significance of the Italian military defeat was a fundamental concern to the Italian state, which was born out of the ashes of, of, of war and the totalitarian regime. However, this concern disappeared in a few months. The victory of the anti-fascist anti forces against fascism and the Nazi occupiers soon became the principal national narrative. If anti-fascist victory and national military defeat were the two sides of the same coin, only the first defeated the selective memory of the newborn democratic state as uh, the legitimizing event. So, while the resistance inspired a massive literary and artistic uh, and filmic production, uh, the vast majority of these accounts were reticent about the military defeat, its horrors, and its responsibility. Malaparte made instead this legacy the main concern of his writing addressing the, the Italian case as a broader, uh, you know, as an example of what was happening to the entire Europe, to European civilization, how, the way he calls it. Um, like many intellectuals of the early 20th century, we need to like, frame Malaparte in, uh, in what was the intellectual history of the time, beyond Italy. Malaparte volunteered in First World War, he was 16 years old, both in France and the Italian front. He then adhered to fascism, believing Mussolini's movement the revolutionary force able to modernize uh, Italy. As a correspondent for the Daily La Stampa, he then traveled to Russia in uh, uh, 1929 and successful published in Paris two essays that analyzed the revolution in Europe. Two uh, essays, the first one is Technique du coup d'état, and the second is Le Bonhomme Lenin, they were extremely successful and impactful throughout Europe. Uh, uh, Trotsky famously discussed uh, Malaparte's idea, dismissing them, of course, in a, in a speech in Denmark. Just to say that th th those were, especially the Nuit du Coup d'État, books that really uh, set the tone of, of a discussion, of a, of a European discussion. Why did he publish these books in, Fra in, in, in French? Because these books could not be published in Italy. And in fact, when he came back after this, this success, he was, um, Malaparte was, was in prison and confined, not because of the books, but because of other uh, prominent uh, people within the, 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 the fascist party that believed that uh, it, got, it was too much on the spot, let's put it this way. So you can see the dynamics of the totalitarian state from this perspective. Uh, so 
he fell from grace after trying to become the, the main intellectual fascist. And I have here about one of his testimonies from the 1950s. This is one of Pante Gini Capri. In which he discussed overtly uh, the point of view of the, those intellectuals who believe in fascism. There is one, okay, there's one missing, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I'll just read it. So Malaparte commented, for the young Italian generation of 1919, Mussolini was their first love, the lover that betrayed them on the moral, political, social, intellectual, artistic level with the old, reactionary generation, the monarchy, the church, big industry, and the nobility. After confinement, Malaparte kept an ambiguous proximity with the regime. And the intellectual freedom he regained in the early 1940s as editor of journals such as uh, Prospettive and uh, um, work correspondent for the Corriere della Sera, this is Prospettive, one of the most important modernist journals of the time that he directed, signaled an artistic independence that was unique under fascism. His ambivalent independence was based more on a personal disappointment than on ethical grounds. So no crypto-fascist agenda in Malaparte. Uh, I have a here a testimony from another historian in 1945 wrote exactly the point of uh, uh, the disappointment of a uh, right-wing intellectual with Mussolini. Fascism in Italy, writes uh, in 45 Paola Latri, died because it had to learn how to keep its promises, not because the promises themselves were revealed to be monstrous. So in this context, Malaparte theorized his practice of artistic autonomy from fascist cultural politics already in 1940, exactly in, this, in the article that we, you see here from, from, um, from Prospettive, in the article Our Sin, Nostro Peccato, an editorial published in that year, which ambiguously hints at a double feature of this writing. Here he writes, what counts the most in our literature are not the pages written, so to speak, with black ink, it's not the visible writing, but what is legible under the page. Everything that is not a precise and perceptible sign. Everything that is written with a white ink. We all want, uh, write with a white ink. And what says our visible writing is exactly the, the completely modern awareness of perceiving under the set pages, the, the thousands other unsaid, forgotten, etc. There's a very, very particular statement of, of uh, his, uh, his own writing, his own poetics. Uh, first is 1940. In fact, far, far from being a, a, an act of political opposition, this is an instance of uh, Malaparte's declared autonomy from politics and propaganda, which is a typical modernist move, if you think about it. So, not a crypto anti fascist agenda, but a refusal of a moral accountability of his own writing for the sake of artistic freedom. The idea of art of our arts autonomy, autonomy from politics supports Malaparte's reports from the Eastern Front during the Axis invasion of Soviet Russia, collected in Volga Rises in Europe. This is the edition of 1943. Um, the book was printed in the winter of 33, before the fall of Mussolini, but did not circulate until the late summer, when the fascist puppet state of Salon confiscated available copies. Throughout 1943, Malaparte sent fiery letters to his publisher, Valentino Pompiani, uh, complaining about delays and to hasten the publication. Malaparte writes in, in these many letters that I have the chance to take a look at, are very, very interesting. Don't pass up this opportunity, he writes in March. Today, everything that's Russian is flying off the shelves. So, <laughs> really, this book will, will sell a lot because it's like, see, Showing, showcasing for the minds that can understand what's going to happen very soon to Italy and uh, probably to Europe. On August 21st, after the fall of Mussolini, but with the fascists still in power, Bonaparte will be even more explicit. And uh, really try to be uh, sensitive to the problem of censorship because uh, what is writing with, a, with one, one ink is something else. I wrote that book, writes Malaparte, the Volga, in the pre Christian period. And it would work perfectly in a period like this, in which the triumph of Christianity is at its top. Christianity, of course, meaning socialism, culture, and culture. 
The Volga Rises in Europe's most striking feature is Malaparte's refusal to comply with fascist official propaganda, which offer its which order to narrate the war against Bolshevism along racial lines. And these are a set of photos that are from the Malaparte archive, because he, as a war correspondent living in 41, in, uh, in the Balkans first and then in Ukraine, he was able to testify firsthand the collide of, of the two armies uh, that would probably possibly decide, the, the, according, according to what he was writing, the destiny of Europe and of European civilization, the Russian and the German, of course. So in the preface of, uh, <coughs> of the book, Malaparte claims, the truth is that Bolshevism is a typically European phenomenon. Behind the Doric columns of Piatilerka, behind the colonnade of Gospel statistics, extend not Asia, but another Europe, the other Europe. Malaparte dismisses here the representation of the war on the Eastern Front as a clash of civilization between the Asian barbarian <coughs> Soviet Russia and the European civilized Nazi uh, Germany and Axis Europe. Really, uh, I also took a look at the Corriere della Sera newspaper. You see these articles, one of Malaparte's articles, and uh, Indro Montanelli or the famous uh, Italian uh, journalists were in the, in the Eastern Front. On the one hand, you see everything depicting clearly racist lines, whereas Malaparte is trying to describe what's going on. And this article by Malaparte, uh, you know, basically, the Italian was writing an article, the, the newspaper was selling 20,000 copies more in Italy. Meaning that he had, it had actually a, a readership, a, you know, a vast readership. So, Malaparte himself made ample use of these stereotypes, racial stereotypes, in you know, other times. But in this article, he repo uh, reported from uh, Eastern Front, once the German army approaches Soviet territory uh, and the clash with the Red Army becomes imminent, he changes radically the tone of the articles. This is another thing. Malaparte, uh, Malaparte unexpectedly now focuses on the su success of the Bolshe Bolshevik experiment in creating the Soviet new man. And the idea of the new man was not just a communist idea, it was an idea of all totalitarianism, especially Mussolini's Italy. At first glance, Malaparte seems to respect the prescriptions of fascist propaganda. However, his portraits of the people he encountered during the campaign, German soldiers, uh, Ukrainian peasants, Soviet combatants, uh, suddenly undermine his propaganda, providing details that subvert the regime's press orders. In key passages, Malaparte declares that, this, that his book attempts to investigate the modern world's ethics. For the author, modern ethics derive from the technical expertise and collective organization of the two colliding armies, which he depicts as functioning like immense, mobile factories. The technological sublime Malaparte employs to narrow the advancing Red Army must have had a, a bitter taste for the Corriere della Sera leader. I'm, I'm reading an excerpt here, which is uh, remarkable because it was first re written about 1941. Communism's greatest industrial creation is its army. Everything in it, from its weapon to its spirit, is the result of 20 years of industrial organization, of the technical education of qualified workers. The real Soviet social body is the army. Because it is in the army that one can measure, it is in the army that one can measure the degree of development and industrial progress achieved by communist society. In a passage such as this, the Italian reader could not but compare the accomplishment of Soviet Russia, the proclaimed worst enemy of fascist Italy, to those of Mussolini's regime. The words Malaparte chooses to describe the Red Army typically echo those of fascist propaganda. 20 years, the Ventennio, which is like something that was hammered in, 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 the, in the minds of Italians. Uh, communism in 20 years was able to create a new tough race. And the idea of the new race was one of the main goals of fascism. So without explicit mention to the current situation, Malaparte unveils the failure of Italian fascism as a national endeavor based on the militarization of society. So, the Volga Rises in Europe underscores how Mussolini's defeat was not only military, but also ideological. In the historic conflict between communism and Nazism, the ultimate loser is the excluded third party, Italian fascism. In Malaparte's writing, the signified clashes with the signified. The praise turns into criticism. 
In his own words, the white ink shows what the black ink hides. Concluding with Malaparte, uh, his position leaves many questions unanswered because uh, he, even after the war, he oscillates between opportunism and foresight. He described his conduct in, in an article called Conscientious Objection, an essay that I think it would be interesting to read now alongside the Chancellor Miwash, the Captain Mind, or Dalino Kish's uh, censorship or censorship. So writers that live through Soviet regimes and that to deal with the self-delusions of intellectual in their time. The newly dictatorship. However, the deal of arts autonomy from politics was not only suspect for fascism, was also dangerous for orthodox Marxists, especially after the war. Only a few months later, Italian intellectuals were outraged when they discovered that the pseudonymous Gianni Strozzi, the author of four columns narrating the liberation of Florence in the summer of 44 for the communist daily Dunita, was actually Curzo Malaparte. And Togliatti, the, the most important, the secretary of the Communist Party, asked Malaparte to write this article, so to be part of the, 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 the new surgical Communist Party. The writer was seen as by the other intellectuals who were outraged, Manaparte was seen as too compromised and publicly exposed with the regime, yet his professed critical autonomy had a major role in the general outcry because a number of former fascists then became communists or, be, or became Christian Democrats. Uh, there's actually a very important book, it became like the book, uh, uh, one of the, the most read books of the time. The title is uh, The Long Journey Through Fascism, about like a young person, a young intellectual, who fought for fascism and then realized uh, the bewilderment of being a fascist and becoming, finding a new way to either communism or Christian, uh, or Christian redemption. But for communists who had fought in the resistance, a comrade Malaparte was more than tenable, but also ideological and reliable. <coughs> and here I stop, like, can, can I get some water from Ben just to... <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, sir. No problem. That's, that's great. <laughs> so, this is one perspective, the perspective, of course, of, of Malaparte and a certain Italian delegate who supported the regime, which supported the regime. My sec the, sec the, the third part of my talk will talk about Alberto Morano. Who writes? I care for him too. Only he was so vain. And then, as I explained to you, I cannot be, fr be friends with a writer who is not a good writer. Books like The Skin are awful. <coughs> Morales judgment, Malaparte, leaves no room for interpretation. And this was an interview like in the early 1980s. In fact, their respective books and personalities could not be more different. However, as I mentioned before, in the 30s, in, in the 1946, their lives are intertwined in meaningful and in, in crucial occasions. This is another picture of Capri, where Morales was a guest in the 1950s. Malaparte supported the younger writer and asked Morales to collaborate on, the many, on his many literary engagements from La Stampa to Prospettive. And uh, these collaborations were vital for Morales, who, after the novel The Time of Indifference, his breakthrough, was harshly ostracized by the, by, by the regime. And uh, as uh, many Italian critics wrote, in recent publication, Moravia long represented the quintessential Jewish writer. So, despite the police, Moravia uh, never published, uh, or maybe not despite, because of the police, Moravia never published anything political during Mussolini dictatorship. However, after du the Duce's arrest in 1943, he published two articles in the anti-fascist newspaper of Italia that are especially interesting and in a way very radical. The first one is titled Demagogues and the Crowd, and the second is Irrationalism in Politics, who reflects major concern that the democracy will develop uh, in these years, but later on also in the, in the most famous novels. These concerns are the psychological features of mass politics uh, and the necessity of political practice based on reason. And in one of these two articles, he writes, the political education of the greatest possible number of individuals is the aim that Italy must set for itself today. Again, 1943. Um, this article 
could have cost Morante, uh, sorry, Moravia his, uh, his life if he had not managed to escape when Rome was taken over uh, by, uh, by the Nazi in the summer of, uh, in the September, sorry, of, 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 of 43. And he escaped with, with his wife Morante, and eventually they were able to reach Naples and, you know, to a safe place outside, uh, under the purview of, of, of America. And there he started to write in the first intervention titled Political Diary in the journal Aretusa, which was a, one of the first journals of liberated Italy in Naples. Um, so, all the columns titled Political Diaries of this period have never been studied, and I try to show some instances here to show the fluidity of the time. So, the columns of Political Diary reflect the post liberation uncertainties with the freshness of a diary, with changing his mind many times, even in a matter of weeks. They are also the first attempt to address the question of totalitarianism in Italy providing arguments for its refusal, even beyond fascism. Uh, Moravia, however, did not return to this publication, and so they, they basically they are not part of his intellectual uh, career, even for what we know. Uh, because this article, uh, in a way, um, show a, 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 a skepticism towards the revolutionary myth and other myths of the, of the, of the late 40s and 50s, they are very, very particular. They, they turn quickly and back. The column published in Aretusa enthusiastically embraces the resistance myth of human renewal, while calling into question neo idealist readings of this. It reads, it's not true that everything is freedom and for freedom in the history of the world. Mass blood and countless sorrows are the price of man's attachment to their own chains. So, what I'm introducing here is a similar issue in the anti fascist debate. Uh, Challenging the idea of a resistance of a people's war and fascism as a parenthesis that was already outlined famously by Le Croce, Moravia addresses the question of the regime's popular consent, analyzing the appeal of totalitarianism and totalitarian rule. Back in Rome after the city's liberation in June 44, Moravia published uh, the pamphlet Hope, Christianity and Communism. Communism, he argues, is the heir of the Christian mission of hope, as it is the only repository of freedom, a new message of hope for mankind. However, what comes from, from Moravia is not that you know, communism really ha could happen, but there is a, the psychological uh, possibility of this hope. So it's interesting the psychological feature of hope for the renewal, for, for renewal of individual and collectivity. Moravia's hope will be repeated many times after the war, unlike what happened with political diary. Uh, already in November 44, however, Moravia published at least title Revolution and Pacifism, which he rejects for the first time revolution as a political practice. He writes in this article, in the eyes of the masses, the ideologies and the eternal spirit that informs them have been supplanted by the revolutionary act of its own and turned into um, a fetish. Now, why do we say that the mythification revolution presupposes not optimism but pessimism? Because the recourse to violence, in particular to violence in the service of the revolutionary idea, is always an act of mistrust in men, even if suggested and guided by the highest utopian faith in the ideas that this act would allow to try. In spite of uh, positive uh, objectives, uh, what Moravia calls the modern revolutionary myth is criticized on the basis of the premises of women and men over politics. The problem is that the, the reason should be part of the discussion, whereas pessimism, writes Moravia, um, postulates there are not enough reasonable people for active <coughs> reforms. Published when Northern Italy was still under uh, the, the Nazi control, revolutionary pessimism never explicitly claims which revolutionary myth was at stake. However, in few, uh, um, in few articles, it would be in Rome, in, in, they would write, for instance, for the, for the journal La Nuova Europa, the New Europe, which was the journal of the Action Party, let's say it was a, a, a very interesting 
part of the debate of the time because the action party presupposes a, a socialism without a, a authoritarian rule, something like it was a laboratory of possible politics. In this journal that lasted very, very few issues, Maurabia in, in published again other installments of political diary. And in this journal, the communist revolutionary myth is now the unequivocal political diary. Here we have uh, the, the the page <laughs> that I'm quoting, the other political. Revolutionary violence is nothing but a means to make certain ideas prevail. The fact it has become a myth or idol indicates that this means has in fact become an act. Or that the ideas are themselves the means to stabilize and indefinitely prolong precisely the violence. A bureaucracy that administers ideas rather than money, that fights to preserve ideological rather than financial capital, the words of distortions, heresies, and deviation rather than wastage and squandering. Here is the origin of clerics and clericalism in churches and in revolutionary parties. And he concludes this other article saying that property similar to sin, not having committed it, does not suffice. One should even desire it. So this article, that, as you can see, is really dis you know, dislocated, is sort of aphorisms about uh, the revolutionary myth, uh, is very different from the previous I say hope. Now, the continuity between Christianity and communism is a, is a, is a moral and political problem. In fact, Moravia sees the evolution of communist ideology into theology, and a, a revolution of revolution to dogma, as a return of authoritarian practices and violent repression. Moravia concludes this piece by describing the revolution as the death of philosophy. So, uh, the produce of political diary would be then removed from Moravia's intellectual body of work. Uh, Moravia identifies the legacy of totalitarian consensus in post war Italy in the appalling lack of democratic education that characterizes Italian society. In words that echo the first accusation Morante spelled out in her diary that we saw earlier, the Italian people are the guilty accomplices who escaped their due punishment. And that's the ending of the last of his political diary article, in which he writes, the people that have killed the dictator proclaims to find him free free, like the criminal who considers himself innocent because he has destroyed the knife, the revolver, the cudgel he used to carry out the misdeed. Okay, and now I'm coming to the, the, my, the third analysis of all my, all my uh, contribution today. On living among us, uh, and some of this license source. After the unique experience, but also the disappointment of post liberation of Rome in 45, uh, Morale and Elsa Morante went back to Capri to work on their fiction. And that's where we find it in 1946. As we saw earlier, this is another picture taken from one of the many parties there. While Moravia was writing Woman from Rome, Morante completed the manuscript of a huge novel that would be published only in 48 with the title Lies and Sorcery. The novel bewildered progressives and conservative readers alike. The characters' self inflicted deception and the repeated redemptive discourses crafted in religious terms reveal an obsession with privilege which permeated Italian traditional society, especially in the South. And that the recent moderniz modernization left untouched. Lies and sorcery exposes how privilege, structure, and discipline individual desire well before the advent of fascism in ways that still persist after fascism's de demise. The characterization of some of the novel's male figures resonates strongly with the piercing remarks that of Mussolini de Malaparte noted in her diary upon his death. Indeed, her remarks on the Duce focus on how Italian eagerly collaborated with the grand delusion narrative Mussolini himself created around his own persona. In Lies and Sorcery, Morante deployed the intertwining languages of romance and neurosis to express the contradiction of her own time, one tour between old privileges and modernization. To the critics, and there were a number lamenting 
lies in source of distance from the collective history and epoch-making facts, Morante responded by describing her own personal experience as a tragic encounter with reality. Many, when the book came out, the critics lamented it was not near realist enough. Uh, would not along certain ideas of Chronicle that would represent uh, the great facts that made Italy win against fascism. Mal um, Morante instead replies in a totally different way, which I found extremely revealing. For everyone, the passage from fantasy to awareness, from youth to maturity, amounts to a tragic and fundamental experience. For me, such an experience was represented and anticipated by the world. That's where Prematurely and with ruinous violence, I encountered maturity. I said all this in my novel, Lies and Sorcery, even though the novel does not talk about the war at all. <clears throat> Morata's novel begins with a young woman, Elisa, who sets out to write her own family saga in the hope of healing from her personal maladies. Elisa recounts the story of three generations of her family in order to heal from what she calls the hereditary disease they ruined their lives, the folly of believing in a fabricated reality in order to overcome the shame of their modest condition. <laughs> For Elisa, storytelling is supposed to bring about understanding, resolution. Still, the distance between the imagined family saga and the petty stories of her parents denies the possibility of a healing for Elisa and any sort of literary redemption, like making up a different story through literature as a sort of making sense of the past, which is a, a typical modernist movement to think about. This unresolved conflict condemns the young woman to neurotic repetition and the fabric of fabricating reality as it were her true memory. It is a story, it's in fact a repetition of what uh, of the family roman, the neurotic family romance described by Freud. It is the pathological correction of the parents' life story in order to compensate for one's own frustrated desire. And Freud describes this family romance thus. If we examine in detail the commonness of these imaginative romances, the replacement of both parents or of the father alone by grander people, we find that these new aristocratic parents are equipped with attributes that are derived entirely from real recollection of the actual and humble ones. Additionally, the novel is covered with Catholic ritual procession, Baroque churches, popular superstition, but except for Elisa, none of the single characters shows any sign of spirituality, for they believe only in their radical egotism. Similar to Morante's to, to, to Mussolini, described by Morante, who is a Catholic without believing in God, her characters are dazzled by the prestige of certain words, history, church, family, people, father, but ignore the substance of things. So, religious terminology and practices are ubiquitous in licensed sorcery, and also are ubiquitous, ubiquitous terms such as riscatto redenzione, which are the terms of the political debate of the time. So, the redemptive trope uh, is deployed in the novel, this is like a, a remarkable fact, not that for collective experience, but only in the first person, only for the, the personal redemption. Morante exposes thus the genealogy of this trope going back to religious roots, but the spiritual void of Morante's character is the reason why Elisa's story exceeds the sublimation of personal experiences. Uh, and in a way, uh, lights and sorcery can be described as a fictional investigation into, into the societal underpinnings of a larger political malaise. That is the collective illusion of fulfilling frustrated desires. Social designs by acquiring privilege that is only nominal. With her eyes fixed on privilege, her characters pursue an individual redemption that is bereft of a collective emancipation. In fact, as uh, Carlo and Edas Goulon suggested in an important essay, in the, in the world of life and sorcery, uh, democracy, they write, does not exist, not even as a mindset. There is no equality or justice, but only. On the contrary, supreme inequality and blood of injustice. Yet, what I would like to add is that the, the, the world depicted in Morante's novel well, did not exist eons ago. It's not like a, an ancient world, even a 19th century, 18th century world. Historically, it 
exactly the time that predated fascism, the so-called liberal age. It was the period in which the practices of coercion and social exclusion, okay, now well, can you think about imperialism and colonialism, uh, that would later define fascism, were seeded to create a modern political substitute for structural privilege that had been legitimized by religion. It is no coincidence that this age is the same historical period that Benedetto Croce, the liberal philosopher, philosopher of Italy, who granted continuity in the state in the with the monarchy after the Second World War, exactly as represented the true Italy, the liberal age, the Belle Epoque in Europe, still unstained, according to Croce, by the foreign disease of fascism. And the idea of a foreign disease was a prominent idea of Croce. He published an article for the New York Times in order to save the idea of a, of a, of a sane Italy in front of the, you know, of the new powers of the post war. So, in Morante's novel, the time of centralized history of both Croce and Mussolini, which, whose own personal family romance probably dates back to the Roman Empire, he was imagining himself as a new Roman emperor, is defined by the non linear temporality of its characters. Through Elisa's storytelling, the novel encompasses the different temporalities of women, without the presumption of assigning definitive roles for their existence, their social fantasies, or even their ghosts. So, there is one last important thing that a remarkable motif in Lies and Sorcery, uh, which foregrounds on social fantasies and personal desire can turn into dystopia. And it's also a way to free this novel from all the reviews that we see at that time, that were even from a lot of communist commentators saying that this good girl, she made an amazing novel, stuff like that. This is what was in fact a novel that, by telling the stories of many generations of women, was addressing the political problems of their time, the persistence of a mentality that was not just fashion, but became before fascism, and fashion just exacerbated. Toward the end of the story, Elisa, and this is a phenomenal passage of the novel, summarizes the content of the letters that her delirious mother, Anna, writes to herself. At the end of the novel, Anna, who's one of the protagonists of the novel, she really goes, goes bananas, she's nuts, because of a love for a person who, who's away, a man who's away, who actually died, but she refuses his death, and she's, she's writing the letters that he, if he were alive, would, would write to herself. I mean, the, the novel at that, that point is really visionary. But well, these letters are very, very particular. Remember, they have been published in 1948. In these letters, he imagined, tra the, tra uh, 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 the imagined traveler promises an eternal love, refers to people and places he has visited, and anticipates that their life together after his return. This idyllic picture is complicated by the disturbing details of this seemingly conventional frame. Elisa observes that. And this is from, uh, from, from the novel. The supreme form of government there was, most certainly, even if the writer doesn't particularly specify this, was the absolute monarchy. Unfortunately, it does not appear from the letters that these crown-wearing friends of the travelers were as sweet and kind to their subjects as they were to him. On the contrary, their exploits, which were loaded and boasted about by the fake travelers, would convert even the most ardent monarchies to republicans if they were to learn of that. For the traveler and his various royals, it would seem that the most delightful privilege of their power was with profanation and injustice, the honor of a sovereign measured by the number of his legacy. The imagined traveler, the lover that this lady who's a you know, in, a, in a state of uh, arrest, of friends that writes to herself, uh, the imagined traveler that, um, then writes Anna about the place where they would live together. It is not just a house, but a royal palace. And this is a description. The building's chief quality, the traveler permanently boasted, was that it was surrounded by a closed wall with no way in or out, and therefore no means of communication with the, world, the outside world. At this point, Elisa, the narrator, interrupts her report and comments, basically for the first time in the novel, on this unsettling nightmare depicted by her mother. One would have said that being imprisoned, interrogated, spied upon, and persecuted didn't cause her to be angry or distressed in the least, but rather gave her pleasure. 
as I said before, when the novel came out, a number of critics said that, oh, this is an, another 19th century novel, it's not like uh, the resistance, so they saw problems, despite it was impressive, uh, despite, despite its impressive language and novelty. But no critic at that time commented on this superb piece of visionary writing. Morata's novel opens here real kind of wounds in a country tainted by fascism, which resolutely wanted to forget the years of consent and the joy felt by many at being relieved of any responsibility, freedom included. Morata touches upon this disquieting insight, compiling extraordinary pages in which memory and dystopia, like here, interfere with the experience reality that the reader of 1948 just left behind, and in which it is afraid to remember perhaps a failure of discovery and an expected nostalgia. And after the anal uh, this analysis of, of Morandi's novel, I beg your pardon and ask for uh, just a little more patience because I want to wrap up things for, for my conclusion. And open possibly uh, some room for debate. So, Democracy and defeat. <clears throat> Post Cold War historiography has shown that, that the transition was marked by institutional and political continuity between the monarchy that supported fascism and the newborn republic led by center right Catholic oriented coalition. However, private memory, public accounts of the time provide evidence of how these years were character characterized by loss, trauma, ideological uncertainties after 20 years of totalitarian pedagogy and enduring effects of war and dictatorship. In this complex situation, the memory of the resistance as a second risorgimento developed also as a result of the political needs of the moment. From contrasting position, political uh, standpoints, Mor Morale, Moravia and Malaparte criticized the preeminence of politics over the lives of individuals. Uh, and it, it led them to, you know, to start the inc incredible inquiries into the debris of pre-war ideas and the anxiety of uh, early post society. Their work ranged from Malaparte's critical appraisal of the national defeat, to Morales' refusal of revolutionary politics, to Morales' denunciation of how gender biases predated, persisted, and survived the fall of fascism. And yet, there is another conclusion here. And we have to go back to Capri to articulate it, and especially to that dinner at the Casa Malaparte in 1946, with which we started our conversation today, to make uh, this final point. In her novel, Malaparte uh, Morante described the royal palace imagined by her protagonist, protagonist as a prison. As he represents in many occasions, however, Malaparte built his famous house in Capri. Uh, with his own memory of trauma of being in prison in mind. And I'm going to show you the interiors that are extremely scant, and uh, the credo of the payment, uh, and even the works of art that he chooses to, to, you know, for his efforts. And uh, there are books, uh, short stories, in which he narrates his experience of his own house and how he built it. And he said, I want to replicate the experience of a prison that I had after my confinement and after, you know, in, in the 30s. Which strikes a, a weird note because we always think about this house as a you know lush Italian style lifestyle. Um, so this idea of prison. So maybe the idea of a prison is a, one of the secrets of this beautiful house that enriches the unique Mediterranean landscape of Italy, as you can see from outside. <laughs> Still, this house sheds light on the difficult heritage of fascism. Not only because it replicates a prison, but because only through the network of privilege that Malaparte established around his own persona, the construction of this house was possible. You cannot build such a house now in Italy on a peak in a random island, first. But second, with this same network of privilege, he, he was able, uh, he permitted Morale Morante, although discriminated as Jews, to publish for his journals and that made the relationship so unique and complex. I would like to leave you with this profound ambivalence, an ambivalence that with Casa Malaparte in Capri is now inscribed in the landscape, with the hope to ignite further discussion. Thank you very much.